You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. If you take your Bibles and turn to Romans, Romans chapter 7. Romans 7, we'll be looking here at verses 13 to 20. Romans 7, verses 13 to 20. And as we turn to this section in Romans chapter 7, we... We actually come to a one of the most controversial passages in Romans. Some would say even one of the most controversial passages in all of Scripture. Some argue that really the controversy started in what we went over last week, but but really it begins here as we come to verse 14 specifically. And the disagreement revolves around who is Paul referring to in this passage. And if we're honest, as you read through these verses, uh, continue on to the end of chapter 7, and so we'll, we'll go through it again to next week as well. As you read through this passage, it's not the easiest to work through. It's not the easiest to understand. And so if there is disagreement among us on who Paul is referring to here, are we going to separate from each other over it? Are we going to question each other's salvation because of it? No, at least for the most part. (laughs) Uh, There are always extreme (laughs) sides of things. Uh, But having a disagreement over who Paul is specifically referring to here, uh, we are likely not to divide over it. And so again, the question is, who is Paul referring to as he uses first-person singular pronouns? And so if I were standing up here as I am, and if I were using first person singular pronouns, who would you think I was referring to? Myself, right? And so as we look at this, though, there are those who say that Paul really is not referring to himself in this passage, but he's using a literary device. And so uh, this I is really a, could be for some, a, um, an imaginary person that he's using to make a point and to illustrate uh, what he's saying. Or or some say that Paul is standing as a representative of Israel. And so this is referring to Israel's experience under the law. And there's others who argue that this is referring to Adam and his experience in the garden under God's commandment. But as you study through this passage, it's very clear that there is no exegetical reason in the context that would indicate Paul is referring to anybody else but himself. Uh, There's just no indication here that we should take it any other way. As we look at this and we say, okay, well, if Paul's referring to himself, that that still doesn't fully answer the question. Because then there's some who say, well, Paul was referring to himself before he was a believer, before he trusted in Christ. And so this is the state of things while he was unsaved in Judaism. And so that's what he's describing here for us. But then there are those who say, no, this is Paul as a believer. And that's what he's showing us here in this passage. Now, there are those who have read their preconceived notions into this passage and have walked away saying that Paul was referring to himself as an unbeliever because they have started from the position of, this is those throughout history, starting from the position of of what was known as the holiness movement. And so saying, listen, Christians can come to a point of sinless perfection. And so certainly the apostle Paul would have known sinless perfection. And so this could not be Paul as a believer. He must be describing himself as an unbeliever. Now, to say that Christians in this life can reach a point of sinless perfection, we know that's hogwash. And actually, I would divide over that. Uh, That is not the case. But now, in saying that, I I don't want to indicate that I'm saying that everyone who holds the position that Paul is referring to himself as an unbeliever takes the position that Christians can reach sinless perfection. That's that's not what I'm saying. 
nor am I saying that that's the logical conclusion of taking this position either. Uh, I want to be very careful of not building straw man arguments. Uh, that, that is not at all the case. Matter of fact, there are those who, not reading their preconceived notions into the text, but, but really are wrestling with what Paul says, and so t- make their arguments from his own words. And, and to be honest, they make pretty convincing arguments. Uh, they look at what Paul says here, as he talks about himself being of the flesh and saying that he is sold under sin. They look at it when Paul says that nothing good dwells in him, and they say, see, this, these must be the words of an unbeliever. And fair enough, when we were in chapter 6, we saw that as believers, we are no longer slaves of sin. And so, again, we can see the argument and see why they come to this conclusion. And there are men who make a very convincing argument, men that I have the uh, highest admiration for, and I'm very grateful for their ministry, men like Richard Caldwell and and the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones and and Rob Ventura and others, that hold the position that Paul is referring to himself as an unbeliever. But then there's the other side, who also wrestle with what Paul says here and looks at his words and say he must be referring to himself as a believer. As Paul talks about the fact that he hates the sin that he does. He hates his sin. He makes that very clear in this passage. Uh, We see that he says that he has the desire to do what is right and that he delights in the law of God. They are all things that only a Christian can truly say. And really, what puts the nail in the coffin in this debate for me is looking at the context of the section of Romans that we're in. Remember, Paul is focusing on sanctification and pointing to our future hope of the glory of God. And so sanctification is the context. So it is most natural to read this as referring to Paul's continual battle with sin as a believer. Paul clearly sees the conflict between the law standard and his own actions. But remember, uh, last time when we were in Romans, we referred back to Philippians chapter 3, and we saw there that as an unbeliever, Paul didn't see that conflict. Instead, when Paul looked to the law, he said that as far as righteousness under the law was concerned, he thought he was blameless. He thought he was doing pretty well. Now, no matter what position we take on this, I do think that Douglas Moo is right when he says that we can get so bogged down with who Paul was referring to in this passage that we actually miss Paul's overarching point. And so we want to be careful not to do that. And the overarching point is Paul continuing to show, as we've already seen in chapter 7, that the law is good and holy. And the problem then is not with the law, But the problem is sin. And specifically here, as we pick up the text, and as we continue on to the end of chapter 7, the problem is specifically our inability to keep the law because of sin. Now, in saying all that, at the same time, that doesn't mean to say that figuring out and and working through the text to know who Paul was referring to is not important. It is, and it's worth digging into the text to to figure that out and find out, uh, because it will affect how you apply the text, and so that is important. And so as we continue here in chapter 7, again, like I said, the, the larger, the context in this larger section, which really started back in chapter 6, where Paul was developing this idea of our future hope of the glory of God as a result of our justification. And this future hope of glory is made all the more sure as God sanctifies us and even sanctifies us through trials, through suffering. So as we set our hope in Christ, having this hope of the glory of God as Christ has secured it for us, as we go through suffering and come out the other side having grown and are growing, then we can come out of suffering with really all the more hope. Because we know that those whom God saves, he sanctifies. And those whom God saves and sanctifies, he glorifies. 
And so we have all that much more hope as we see the work of God in us, growing us in holiness. And so again, it's the idea of sanctification here in this section. As we trust in Jesus Christ, having no righteousness of our own. And this idea of being justified, being credited with Christ's righteousness by faith, is the very thing that Paul was developing, and I'd say even defending here in this letter to the Romans. As we trust in Christ alone, we are credited with the work of Christ, who represents us before the Father. So by faith, we are immersed into Christ, so that as our representative, we are in Christ. So that in what Christ did when he died, we were in him when he died. So that his death was our death. So that his crucifixion was our crucifixion. We were in Christ. So when he died for our sins, that was our death to sin. Therefore, he paid for all who would believe upon him. And so being in Christ, we who believe have died to our sin. Who we used to be died with Christ. And so we have been raised with Christ that we may walk in the newness of life. And so we read Paul say, Christ was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. So we are no longer who we used to be. No longer enslaved to sin. No longer condemned being bound under the law. But that old self has died And we have been raised new. So we no longer live in sin. For sin is no longer a slave master over us. But even though we do not live in sin anymore, that does not mean that sin no longer lives in us. And that's an important distinction. For we remain in this sin-stained body. And therefore we must go to war with whatever sin remains in us. For we remain in this, this what's left over from Adam. And so we must fight against the sin that is there. For it is still trying to gain back power. And so that struggle with sin is what, again, I argue we see here from Paul's life. What he's describing here in chapter 7. And this struggle with sin is true of every believer. And so, there is much we have to learn by looking at chapter 7 here. And so, if you would, read along with me as I read out loud. Romans chapter 7, starting here in verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So, now again, like I said, coming off last time, Immediately before this, we see Paul has talked about how he came to realize he was dead when the law was presented to him. And so to make sure that his words cannot be twisted and to make sure that, that as he knows the arguments that were often raised against his teachings, even as he would preach in the synagogues in every new city he would go to, And as he wanted to prepare the Romans to be able to defend the faith, he makes sure that that what he has said is understood and that it, it can be defended. And so nobody can say, Paul, you're trying to throw out the law. You're trying to say the law is bad. See, you're saying the law brought death to you. 
And we can see why someone may say that. Again, Paul had said in what we went over previously, when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. And so then Paul would anticipate someone saying, okay, so you're saying that the law brought death, and that's because of the law you died. And so Paul asked the question, did that which is good, the law, did that which is good then bring death to me? And what's Paul's response to that question? It's the same response he's had with every question that he has raised to make sure his words aren't twisted. He uses the strongest negative he can in the Greek in saying, by no means. May it never be. Absolutely not. Don't even think such a thing. Again, as we saw last time, the problem is not the law. The problem is sin. And so here in verse 13, this is a transitional verse. As the new section really begins in, in verse 14. But as he makes this transli- transli- transition, sorry, he wants to make sure we understand where the problem really lies. The problem is sin. Now, we may protest and say, but Paul said sin sees the opportunity through the commandment. And so deceived him through the commandment, killed him. Yet he insists that the law is good. But how could it be then that what is good is not what brought death? Well, because we have to understand the difference between means and causes, between instruments and agents. So, for instance, let's just take Spencer right here, right? If Spencer was playing his saxophone, and he hits this high F-sharp note, and then he flutters down a jazz scale in a Bobby Watson-like manner, would we say, wow, look how good Spencer's saxophone plays? Is that what we say? No, we'd say, wow, look how good Spencer plays. Right? That's what we would say. Spencer is the agent while the saxophone is the instrument. Spencer is the cause, whereas the saxophone is the means for Spencer playing great music. And so we have to understand that difference. So in Paul's explanation here that we saw last time, the law was not the agent, but the instrument. Sin was the cause, but sin used the law. Sin used that which was good as a means to bring death. Sin, not the law, was responsible for death. But again, we might ask, if the law is good, how could sin use the law to bring about death in Paul or death in me and you? Because by doing so, the intent of the law is accomplished. Look what Paul says there in verse 13. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So by sin using the law, sin was exposed for, by, for its true nature. So I can't claim what's in me is good if what's in me is sin, and the law exposes that. No, the true nature of what's in me is seen. And not only that, when the law comes, as we've seen earlier in Romans, that brings more culpability for sin. And so now because of the law, sin is seen as utterly sinful. And so what's in me, again, is far from good, but utterly sinful. Sinful, or as the ESV has it here, sinful beyond measure. So there's no way to claim that I am good. Again, like we saw last time, this is why we need to present the law in the proclamation of our gospel. 
because the law reveals sin. The law reveals that we are lawbreakers. It shows the utter sinfulness of sin and so reveals what we have earned because of our sin. We need to preach the full gospel. We need to preach sin and condemnation. We need to preach the bad news in order to know and understand how good the good news is. In order for someone to know and understand they are under the bad news. And they need good news. They need a savior. We need to proclaim the whole gospel. And not only that, though, as well, but we have also see this. As sin is utterly sinful, God's law is holy and utterly good. Because though sin used the law as an instrument for death, the law nonetheless upheld its purpose and brought out the true knowledge of sin. And so that's what we see here in verse 13, as Paul again is transitioning into this new section, which starts here in verse 14. And again, as we come to verse 14 then, Paul is showing his assurance that the problem is not the law, because as we come to verse 14, he shows the very nature of the law itself. But then at 2, as we come to verse 14, that's where the controversy starts. Who is Paul referring to in all of this? And like I said, I'm convinced that Paul is referring to himself as a believer. But that's still not where the questions end either, though. Because even for those who say, okay, Paul is referring to himself as a believer in this passage, it still raises the question, is he referring to himself as a a immature believer, an infant in Christ, right after he trusted in Jesus, or is he referring to himself as he was writing Romans? And so referring to himself as a mature believer. And I would argue that there's indications in the text that lets us know how Paul is referring to himself. As we've been going through this, we see that before when Paul was referring to himself when he thought he was alive, but then the law came and he died, he he recognized that sin was in him, and that he was dead in sin. When he was talking about that, which was previous, he talked about it in past tense, which only makes sense, right? And we see that, for instance, he says, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. So it's all in the past tense, And so that's what we've been seeing through this section so far. But when you come to verse 14, then it switches, and now he begins to talk in the present text tense. And so that should indicate to us, Paul now is talking about himself as he was writing this letter. He was talking about himself in the present condition he was in right there and then. And so therefore, talking about himself as a mature believer. And so as we... Pick it up here in verse 14. Again, Paul is showing that he understands and is very clear on the fact that the law is not the problem. And that's because of the very nature of the law. And what is the nature of the law? Well, Paul says in verse 14 that the law is spiritual. The law is spiritual. And in contrast to the law then, Paul says that he is fleshly. The law is the very standard of God, given under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Man, including Paul, and certainly including you and I, we are fleshly. We have no natural ability in of ourselves to keep the law. If we try in our own efforts, even as believers, to keep the law by our own strength, we're only going to fall short. We're going to fall infinitely short of the standard of God's law. If we look to Jesus for our salvation, only then to look to the law to strive to accomplish our own sanctification, we err and we're not going to succeed. And yes, even as we are going to war with our sin, That war, which I would argue is the Christian life. 
as we still have this flesh tainted with sin until we die and or receive our resurrection bodies. Until then, our flesh is weak. So if we rely on the flesh, if we rely on ourselves, we're going to find ourselves sold under sin. Just as we read here. And really, that, that's a good translation that we see here in the English Standard Version, sold under sin. Uh, the New American Standard Bible says sold into bondage to sin, but, but really the English Standard Version is better here. Sold under sin. We are free. In Christ, we who believe, we are free. But sin still is a working force in our flesh. We're going to see Paul say next week in verse 23, But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. It's in his, <clears throat> in his members, the parts of him, in his mortal body, where he finds this power of sin. It's not in the inner man that is alive and being renewed, No, it's in his flesh. There, sin is a powerful influence that, as we are new in Christ, we must fight against it. Like we said, going through chapter 6, though we no longer live in sin, again, sin still lives in us. Sin is in our flesh. And so we must fight against it because sin is fighting to regain its power over us. That's why Paul said in chapter 6, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. And there's so many other guys who have pointed out that the reason Paul says that is because we could end up letting sin reign in our mortal bodies. And we're not to do that. And so Paul said in chapter 6, do not offer your members, those parts of yourself, as weapons of unrighteousness. If we do that... If we give in to sin and so use our body and use our mind and use our will for the works of sin in us, we're going to give sin the influence again in our lives. We're going to let sin reign. No, we're not to do that. Instead of offering our members as weapons of unrighteousness, Paul told us to offer our members as weapons of righteousness. We need to understand there is a constant battle going on. There is a war. A war between the work of the Spirit in us, growing us in holiness, and a war against and with our flesh. If we look to the law and we try to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, and we try to cause ourselves to progress in sanctification, we will not succeed against the sin in our flesh. But when we get to chapter 8, we'll see that the battle is won by looking to Christ. By remembering the gospel. By depending upon the work of the Holy Spirit, transforming us by renewing our minds. And so in chapter 8, we'll read this in verses 3 through 6. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Remember, as we saw in the beginning of chapter 7, we no longer serve in the old way of the written code of the the external standard of, of the law written on tablets passed down by Moses. No, now we serve in the new way of the Spirit. 
We no longer look to the law and try to muster up our own strength to say, I'm going to meet it. I'm going to do what it says. No, instead we look to the power of the Spirit. And we rely on the Spirit to strengthen us, to obey our God and defeat sin in our lives. So again, Paul says in his flesh, he's sold under sin. In his flesh, he, he cannot do it. He cannot obey in of himself. And he explains further this idea of being sold under sin in verse 15 when he says, For I do not understand my own actions. Paul saw something in himself that was contrary to the holiness he pursued. Uh, There was a conflict. Uh, There were things that he did that did not line up with his desire to please God. He wanted to be more like Christ. He wanted to please God with holiness. But when he looked at himself, he saw that he did not measure up. Again, this is how it is for all believers, each one of us. I had different examples of the things that can stir up sin in us and and show that this is true for all of us. And, and my first example here actually was thought about throwing it out due to the events that took place yesterday in Butler, PA. But maybe we need to think about it just as much now, if not more. When we look at ourselves, do we see things that don't measure up with our desire to please God? Do we see things that stir sin in us? Maybe we can see the hatred that there is in our politically divided nation. We see the cutthroat nastiness that is constantly before us with every commercial on both sides of the aisle, with the debate that we saw. And as we see comments and campaign promises that has moral implications... And these implications that go against our strongly held convictions, whether it's dealing with abortion or marriage or how limited the government is actually biblically intended to be, it can easily stir up in us that same cutthroat, hateful nastiness that we see all around us. And even as it's easy for us to look at someone else and judge someone else and say, see, I'm not like that. Remember the things that we've said of the warnings of Jesus as he explained the extent of the law on the Sermon on the Mount. You say that you're not a murderer, you've never killed anybody? Have you been unjustly angry? hateful, full of bitterness and rage, you're guilty. The seeds of murder are in your heart. And when we stand to give an account before our God, he will judge us not just for our outward actions, but he will judge us by the condition and intent of our hearts. We're all guilty. So these things can expose the sin that remains in us. And not just politics, even more menial things. Playing or watching sports can do this. Uh, Nate uh, put together a softball team for for those of us that uh, are able to play, uh, to build camaraderie among us and to just enjoy our time together and It's been good as we play on Thursday nights. But when we're in a game and we're being beaten up like a tied-up goat, and the other team is rallying, and and we just need one more out to stop the bleeding, and then a guy steps up to the plate and smashes yet another ball into center left field, it could be easy to think as you're watching him round the bases, coming around second, heading to third, that, you know, it'd be nice if he just tripped and face-planted right in front of the shortstop. And then we can get the out and we'd be done with, with this pain. 
And I've said to Eric, who's our third baseman, listen, you can't say those things. No, I'm just kidding. He, he hasn't said that out loud. No, I'm kidding. But whether politics or sports, or maybe out of self-love, where we want to avoid conflict, and so maybe we're not as honest as we should be, maybe in the heat of a moment such as, you know, we're trying to stay away from conflict, you know, maybe just spurring out of our mouth is something that is not just not as honest as we should, but is a flat-out lie. Or in other ways, maybe temptation rises and we just blow it. Whatever it is. And immediately after, we find ourselves asking, why did I do that? Why did I say that? How could I have thought such a thing? This is not what I want to be doing. In the moment, there may have been part of us. More accurately, there was part of us that did want to, or else we wouldn't have. There is part of us that still wants that sin, or else there would be no temptation before us. But when we reflect on what we did and what we said, We see that what we said and did is what we hate. Because really, when it comes down to it, we do want to please God. We do. And so we're brought down to brokenness saying, Lord, I I am sorry I acted so foolishly. I, I am sorry for my sin against you. Will you please forgive me? And in broken repentance, we confess whatever it is, whatever our sin may be. Confessing it because we we want to walk in a close relationship with our Lord without the hindrance of sin. We want to be growing and knowing him more and more day by day as we recognize how great and glorious he is and what a mighty savior he is to save a wretch like me. And Paul understood this. The Apostle Paul understood this. And so he said, as we could all say with him, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. And here's the truth. The more you actually grow in holiness, the more sin you will see in your life. Because the more you grow in holiness, the more aware and the more sensitive to what sin is in your life you become. The more you grow in holiness, the more you will see things in your life that you hate, that you wish weren't there. And it's really only the Christian that hates such things. It's the Christian that hates what they see in them that is in contrast to the holiness of God. That's in contrast to pleasing God. And they hate it because Christ saved them. You hate it because Christ saved you and made you new. Having died as your representative, when he died, you died. And because of his resurrection, you now live in the newness of life. You're not who you used to be. You now hate what you used to love. And the holiness you used to hate, now you love. You see what love your God and Savior has had for you. And you love him in return. And out of that love, you desire to please him and obey him. Yes, you may struggle with sin as you hate even the slightest infraction against God's holiness that's in you. But you hate it because Christ saved you. Because you are his. And so hating it, you look to the power of the Holy Spirit to do what you must to see that you rid your life of it. You go to war to see that it dies within you. 
So though there, though there are things you find in your life that you hate, you see that you are not where you should be in your pursuit of holiness. You see that you're not where you want to be in your walk with the Lord. And you mourn that. And yet at the same time, though you're not where you want to be in your walk with the Lord, as you look back, you're not where you used to be either. And you can rejoice in that. You can be so thankful as God is working in you. Grace is having its transforming effect in you. Do not despair, but press in all the more to your Savior. See how much he has loved you and motivated by his great love for you, love him in return, pursuing the death of whatever sin remains in you. But if the truth is you actually do continue to love your sin, if really you you don't have any care for holiness, then at that point, yes, there is reason to question the validity of your profession of faith. Uh, Maybe you've just gave mental assent to Jesus as your Savior. All the while, you're really just striving for your own righteousness in what you do in patting yourself on the back to say you're a good person. Or maybe you've given mental assent to the idea of grace and justification by faith because you know that's what you're supposed to do, and that's how you grew up, and that's just how it is. And so you make this verbal profession, but but it has no real grasp of your life. You see the work of God in you. But if you are believing upon Christ, and you say, yes, but I'm still struggling with sin, but I do want to please God. I do love him. I want to obey him. I want to strive with everything I have to obey him. If that's you, then brother or sister, rest in Christ. Reflect on the gospel that you have believed. Remember your Savior's love and remembering his love and seeing his love in the gospel. Grow in your love for him. So then in all of this, as Paul is looking at this struggle within himself, this struggle reminds him of how good the law is. It's clear the problem is sin in him. The problem's not with the law. Matter of fact, it's the very truth that he does what he hates and doing what he hates demonstrates that the law is good. It's the fact that when he sees in him what is contrary to the standard of the law, when he he does what he hates and he stands back and he says, why did I do that? And that he, he genuinely says, I never want to do that again. It shows that he agrees that the law is good. That he really does know it's good. And so even as we go through all of this, again, the law cannot save us. The law cannot sanctify us. As we look to the law in our own strength and we try to hold up the standard, that external standard that the law is, we're going to fail. We're not going to make it. But that doesn't mean we throw out the law. The law has its proper place in reminding us of God's standard, of showing us God's will. It shows us what is sin. And it puts on display for us the holiness of God. The holiness we pursue, not in the power of the law, because there's no power there, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, in all of this that Paul is saying, the problem is not the law. The law is good. The problem is sin that was in Paul. 
Because the problem is sin that's in you and me. And as we see Paul going through this and saying all this, as you, you look at verse 17, he says, So now it's no longer I who do it, do the things that he hates, but sin that dwells within me. And many commentators are quick to point out, and rightfully so, this is not to say Paul was not the problem. Uh, Paul is not trying to separate himself from his sin and saying, listen, that's, that's not really me. I'm not really responsible for that. But as Paul has been personifying sin to make the point that the law is good and not the source of death, but that sin is the source, We have to not understand this as Paul trying to escape responsibility. Because even when Paul says, it's not me, it's sin living in me. It's not I who do it, it's sin. But when sin is in you, it's still you carrying it out. And even with this, it's Paul the one who's carrying out the sin that's within him. Again, we mentioned that there are those who talk about the, the carnal Christian. Right? We talked about how uh, the, there's those who point to 1 Corinthians and how Paul told the Corinthians that they were carnal. And this is also another passage that they'll point to and say, see, Paul is saying it's not really him. And so when I sin, it's not really me. That's, that's sin in me. That's my old self that, that's, that's been crucified and dead. That, that's who that is. But who I really am, I'm the one following Jesus. The sinner that comes out every now and then, that's, that's not me. And, and, and it becomes as if we make this false dichotomy as if when we sin, we're not responsible for it, because that's my old self. That's not what Paul's saying here. If that is what Paul was saying, why would it matter if he did the things he hates? It would have no meaning at all. If that's what Paul is saying here, that would be to make this passage completely illogical. But to be fair... When we're looking to justify our sin, we need to take logic and reason and throw it out the window. Paul's point, though, is that now the new person in Christ is at odds with the sin that remains in his flesh. Flesh is, sin is a powerful force and influence in our flesh. It taunts, and it tugs, and it deceives. We're responsible if we follow those tuggings and deceitfulness into things that we're not to do. And so we are, again, to do battle with that sin. We're not to follow its leading. And what does Paul conclude? The reason he continues to wrestle with sin and even does what he hates, is because, as he says, nothing good dwells within him. And he gives clarification, nothing good dwells within his flesh. In that part of him from his first father, Adam, that still remains. There's nothing good there. So in of himself, Paul cannot accomplish the good that he wants to do. If he looks to his own strength, he will not live for God as he wants to, and he does want to, as he's writing this. But he finds no ability to live for God in himself. Does this mean then that there was never any good that Paul accomplished? Does this mean that there was no growing in holy living in pleasing God as he wanted to? Of course not. That's not what this means. But it's not within himself that he found that ability. That's the point. It is the effectual work of grace. It is looking to Christ. It is compelled by the love of Christ. It is in the transforming work of the Holy Spirit that Paul found the ability to do good. And again, that will become clear in chapter 8. But within himself, in his flesh... Where the war against sin rages, there's nothing there in Paul himself 
to enable him to do good. Just as there's nothing in you or in me to enable us to do good. There's nothing in us that would cause us to be able to please God. So again, if we look to ourselves, if we aim for the external law, we're never going to accomplish anything good. Instead, we must look to the enabling work of grace as we depend upon the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we see Paul finds himself in conflict. Verse 19 says, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. Which is really pretty much what he said in verse 15. And then Paul draws a conclusion where he reiterates what he said in verse 17. Verse 20 says, Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Again, Paul is not shirking responsibility here. But this demonstrates the depths of the corruption in his flesh. This demonstrates the powerful influence of sin under which Paul, in his flesh, is sold. And I think each one of us can identify with this struggle. We all have this experience with sin. And again, the problem is sin. I can't reach the law's demands because of sin in me. I'm going to fail every time I try in myself. I can't do what the law calls me to, but the problem's not with the law. The problem's with me. The problem is sin in me. And the problem is sin in you. And you know that I know you have sin. And the person behind you knows you have sin. And the person in the pew over knows you have sin. And you know I have sin. We know this. And how do we know this about each other? Besides the fact that we hang out with each other enough. But really, first of all, the gospel tells us this. The very reason we need a savior is because we're sinners. The very reason we can't save ourselves is because we're sinners. Also, too, it's the testimony of Scripture that tells us we continue, every one of us, to struggle with sin. And not just here in Romans 7, but I also think of 1 John 1, where the apostle is writing to believers. And in verse 8 says, if you say you have no sin, you lie and the truth is not in you. We all still have sin, and yet what do we do? We come to church, we slap a smile on our face, and we act as if we have it all together. But we're all good, right? And as we see others seeming like they have it all together, while we're really struggling, we start to question ourselves and doubt and say, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with my walk with the Lord? Because they seem to be okay, but I'm not okay. Even maybe this morning, maybe as you're getting ready for church and the kids did whatever and whatever happened and and maybe you weren't as patient with the kids as you should have been and you lost your temper. Maybe you were snippy with your spouse. And now, you all had to ride to church together. And as you sit in church, wallowing in guilt, not focused on the singing, the reading, the preaching, just focused on getting out the door when it's all done. But one thing I I want us to hear and understand is that we should not fall into despair in our continued war against sin. We have to be honest with each other. We all struggle. And that's part of why we're together. That we can come alongside of each other. Point each other to Christ. Remind each other of the promises that are in Christ. Point each other to Scripture and the work of the Spirit. 
and encourage each other and exhort each other. We need that from one another. Every one of us does. And often we continue to struggle and fight against the same temptations. And though we may beat our body today and force it into submission, we must go back tomorrow and fight the same battles. And that can be daunting. And you find a thought in your head, a bitter remark comes flying out of your mouth. And as you say with Paul, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Don't fall into despair. Don't fall into despair and come to ask yourself, am I I even saved? If you are doing battle with sin, if you are really going to war with it, that is evidence of your salvation. The fact that you hate your sin and delight in God's law is evidence of a changed heart. The unbeliever, the one who does not know God's grace, who is not indwelled by the Holy Spirit, that one does not battle their sin. They're not troubled by their sin, beyond maybe not wanting to look bad or or thinking better of themselves. Beyond that, they're, they're, they're just fine with their sin. But you who believe, when you look at your sin and you mourn that your sin is an offense against the God you love, the God who so loved you, and that's why you hate it, and that's why you go to war with it, that's why you seek to kill it, because you love your God, you want to please your God in obedience to him. Your desire is to serve him well, who is your Lord. My friends, that's evidence of the work of God in your life. So brothers and sisters, do not despair. Instead, continue in the battle, in the war. And as you do, continue to look to Christ. Preach the gospel to yourself. Be reminded of the love of God the love he has had for you. And so be motivated with love for him to continue to engage in the warfare against your sin. Continue to seek to kill it everywhere it's found. And as you fight this fight against sin, even as you fight the same fight against the same sin over and over again, rest in the promises that Christ has purchased for you. Promises as we read in Philippians Chapter 1, verse 6, when Paul said, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. You're not where you wish you were. You're not as far as long in your sanctification as you think you should be. But you're not where you used to be. He began a work in you. On that day you believed, he began a work in you, and he promised to complete that work. The day is coming when you will stand before your Lord, and seeing him, you will be like him. You will be whole, and you'll be sinless. And being sinless, you will worship him, and know him, and love him like you've never been able to do in this life. Because sin will not be a hindrance anymore. It'll be gone. That's a great promise we have. On the day we see our Savior, which is exactly what we read of in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. The apostle says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. What a promise that is. The unbeliever has the promise of wrath and damnation for eternity. We have the promise of seeing our Savior in all of his glory and being with him who we love. And in that day, sin will be gone. We will be freed from the presence of sin, even now as we are free from the bondage of sin. 
And John says, everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. As we have this hope in Jesus Christ, as we look forward to this day, we are spurred on to pursue holiness. We are spurred on to continue in that warfare, to kill our sin. Because we know what Christ has done to purchase this promise for us. And we know that as we do battle, the battle is already won. The day will come when we are like Christ, when we are sinless. And so, brothers and sisters, cling to this hope. Be motivated to kill your sin, knowing your hope is secure. Not because you secured it by anything that you've done, but because Jesus secured it, and so nothing can take it away. Cling to this hope. And I plead, if you are not trusting in Jesus Christ, I hope you understand you don't have this hope. If you're trusting in anything about you, uh, you you cannot look forward to the day of being with your Savior. All you have to, to do is look forward to the day of paying for your sin for all eternity. But if you recognize in yourself that you do not see the work of God, there's no evidence of the the work of the Holy Spirit indwelling you, that you have not truly put your trust in Christ alone to save you. I plead with you, please trust in Christ. Know the work of him who is the God-man, who left heaven to take on human flesh, to represent humanity before the Father, that he would be the representative of all who would believe on him. So that if you would believe on Christ, his death, his sin-paying suffering and death would be your payment for sin. Be your death to sin. And his resurrection power would be what raises you to the newness of life that today you would no longer be who you used to be. But risen, a true Believer in Christ, righteous before God, not in your own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Jesus. Having these promises, knowing the love of God, and so loving him in return in all that you do. Believer, cling to the promise that you have because you've trusted in Christ. And if you're not trusted in Christ, flee to Christ and trust in him, and you will be saved. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnvbc.com.